I guess we'll get started. Um, welcome to Sustainable Brewing with Mash Filtration. Um, the gentleman here to my left uh, doesn't really much need much of an introduction, as you probably should know him by now, but uh, this is Rich Michaels. Uh, Rich is currently at Leeds IDD Brewing, Brewing Engineering and Technical Sales Support Team. Rich is a diploma graduate of Siebel Institute in Brewing Science and Technology and a master brewer with 30 years in the brewing industry, ranging from well-known craft startups such as Founders and Frog Alley to nationally known brands like FX Mac, Matt Saranac. In the last 14 years, he has exclusively been in breweries with mash filters. He currently teaches brewing programs at two colleges and is active in Master Brewers Association of America. Welcome, Rich Michaels. Small room, so I can just speak up, probably. Um, <clears throat> so I see a few people here that actually have mash filters. Uh, I see somebody here who has a lot of fun in a big brewery that happens to have a mash filter, too. We try to stay out of the way, I guess. Um, so as brewers, we have a couple of important jobs. Uh, cleaning, you know, without sanitation, um, we can't make good beer. Uh, our job in the industry is actually to brew and sell great beer. Um, just because it's your favorite style doesn't mean it's uh, going to sell. Uh, there's a lot of different models that are, are successful. A lot of people here are from different, uh, sure, um, different models, brew pubs, tap rooms, uh, production breweries. And our goal here is to run a successful production business. You know, we want to be able to do this and uh, still have a job tomorrow. Um, it's not a hobby. There's a lot of people who get into brewing as a hobby and successfully transition to um, brewing commercially. Uh, but at the end of the day, we do need to run a business. Um, here's a brewery, uh, mass filter setup. I think that is uh, yours, good nature, in uh, Hamilton, New York. I got mass filter pictures from all over the world as we go. I'll try and tell you what they are. Any questions at all, please raise your hand anytime at all. Um, so as brewers, we actually make wort. Yeast is actually what turns the wort into beer. Our job is to reduce uh, wort by extracting uh, sugar from grains. We also add hops. Hops give beer bitterness and flavor. Uh, we're also finding where everybody else is having another talk right now. Uh, some of the stuff we get out of hops will be processed by the yeast to produce other things, um, glycosides, thiols, all that cool research right now. Um, yeast will also produce esters and flavor. So in the brew house, it's important that we make a consistent wort, um, a good uh, extraction of sugar, a nice blend of hops. Uh, we do want it to be a consistent blend as well. Uh, we do want to keep our yeast happy and healthy. Uh, yeast is going to do its job as long as it's uh, able to do so. And ideally for sustainability, um, also for quality, we want to benchmark ourselves um, in the brewery. When I say by quality, we want to be able to make sure we have consistent materials. You know, this is not always something that's easy to do. Uh, wine producers have good years and bad years. Uh, brewers are expected to have good beer all the time. Uh, so as brewers, we need to make adjustments in our process and our supply side to make sure we get good, consistent materials. We want to make sure we treat things similarly every time. We want repeatability in the brew house, uh, timing and process. Uh, we want a consistent pH and gravity in our beer. And hopefully that's going to lead us to consistent flavor and having a good quality beer. Notice the trend here is all about consistency and uh, you know, ways to benchmark that. One of the things to look at is actually efficiency. Things that are important for us from a financial perspective, or how much time does it take to produce a beer? How many beers can I produce a shift? How many beers can I produce a day? How many beers can I produce a week? Uh, the labor costs, you know, let's take a look at time and wages to do that as well. And then from a process standpoint, we want to make sure we're recovering um, the same uh, quality and consistency of extract. So ways to do that, we're going to measure the gravity of our wort. We're going to measure the volume of wort that comes out of the system. Any questions so far? So brewing efficiency, how do we look at that? We're going to take a look and say how much sugar could we get out of our grain on a really good day if everything works right? Um, so we can say if there's 80 pounds of potential extract in a batch of grain and we get 60 out of it, that's 75%. Um, you know, efficiency can vary for many reasons. Um, 
it can come down to lots of materials, uh, the year of the crop, um, the brewer, how much grain you're loading into your match ton or match filter or water ton. Uh, but if you benchmark, you'll be able to make adjustments. So ideally, you want to do some type of efficiency calculation. And we can look at, um, like I said, the material coming in, see how much potential extract there is, and then how much of that we got out, how much yielded to the whirlpool potentially, or how much yielded to the fermenter. Um, and this can vary based on the design of the equipment, uh, how much grain we're loading in, recipe, your brewing process, and like I said, the brewer, who always called that the Joe factor. There's always, you know, maltsters have some maltsters have very small systems where, you know, the operator actually has an impact on the flavor, and it can vary based on operator. Uh, as brewers, we don't like that. Um, but we want to take, this is also a really good way to look at raw material change. You know, we all know the 2021 crop <clears throat> really sucked from a malt standpoint. Uh, some of us are probably still dealing with that now in blends. Uh, but, you know, if you're benchmarking and looking at efficiency continuously, you can put a dollar value on those changes and you can go back to your maltster and uh, ask for uh, better quality malt. Um, so how do we do that? You know, I kind of broke this back to the beginning. Um, you know, we need to have a malt analysis to do a full efficiency calculation. I see everybody here, uh, just nod your head. If you get a malt analysis every time you buy grain, I only, see a couple, I only see a couple of people doing that. So this is something you should be asking for. Um, and then eventually you can use this to do these calculations. And if you're asked for it, you know, they're going to know that you're checking or think that you're checking, and you'll probably wind up with better quality. Uh, so it's a good thing to have. And you know, food safety, uh, these days, Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, these are things that you want to have around in case there's ever a problem. So we're going to take a look at extract as is, coarse grind as is. Uh, that's our parameter. Uh, you should be able to get this from your maltster. Um, if not, there might be some calculations. They may not provide it as, uh, as is. They may provide it as dry basis, but you can do that math. Um, in this example here, extract as is, course nine, um, is actually 77%. So that means for every 100 pounds of grain, there's 77 pounds of potential sugar for you to get out as a brewer. Um, if we do the math on that, we have 500 pounds of that grain. Multiply that by 77%, we have 385 pounds of extract that we can actually make beer out of, if we do a perfect job. Life's not like that. Um, so we take a look at the potential, and we need to figure out how much we got out in our process. Um, if we yielded eight barrels of wort at 13 Play-Doh, uh, or 10, 52, 6, if you're using specific gravity, ideally you want to figure out what that means. So using these numbers here, we can actually take um, my dead remote. There we go. And we can look up 13 Play-Doh or the specific gravity on an ASBC extract table, which you can uh, look up and see how many pounds of extract. So what that means, out of 13 Play-Doh beer, or 1052, if that's what you're doing, uh, specific gravity, you can actually look at this chart and say, okay, per barrel, that means there's 35 pounds of sugar dissolved in our wort. So every barrel of wort has 35 pounds of sugar in it. And that's our extract. That's what we're trying to get to. Um, and we have eight barrels of it. We can multiply that and say eight times 35.29. We can actually figure out we actually have 282 pounds of extract. So we can say, okay, we started with 385. We yielded uh, 282. At the end of the day, we only extracted 73% of that sugar. That's not abnormal for a craft brewer. I've seen craft brewers go from 60 to 90 percent. It's not uh, uncommon to see losses this high. In this example, 26 percent of that potential grain sugar went on to feed cows. I mean, who's who's excited about losing 25 percent of your extract? The cows. Yeah, it's uh, very good. Um, you know, you wouldn't accept that if you brought in a stack of cans and took 25% off the top and threw them out. That wouldn't be acceptable to you, but in brew houses, people seem to get used to this. We can take a look at another example here. Um, we take our pounds of malt times our extract coarse grind from our analysis. In this example, we have 77.2% coarse grind as is, 1,000 pounds of malt, 772 pounds of potential extract. So I mentioned the extract table. That's a great way to do that. They're measured tables, uh, lots of good historic data there. 
We can also do a pretty quick estimate of this. If we take our degrees Plato, add that to 259, multiply it by our degrees Plato, divide by 100, we'll actually come up with a really good approximation for pounds of extract per barrel. 259 is the weight of a barrel of water. So that's where that comes from. And this is from the Practical Brewer. I think the copy I have is from 1972. Um, you can actually be a little more accurate with this, predicting by dialing in 258.7 pounds per barrel for water. But the extract table is probably your best bet. And if you get online, you can probably find that pretty easy to download. Um, I made my students do that years ago. Uh, they had to do extract tables using formulas. Um, so to figure out extract recovery, We'll take our barrels of cooled wort times the amount of pounds per barrel, and we'll actually come up with a value of pounds of extract that we recovered. So you can solve for this yourself if you have the following data. You just need to know your gravity, and you need to know how much you have. So it's a pretty simple formula. So how, what does this translate to? What does it look like? Um, a brewery that's 65% efficient, 100 pounds of grain yields about 49 pounds of extract. So of that pallet of grain, only 49% of it is useful to you. Uh, if you move up to 80% efficiency, you're about 60%. And at 95% uh, efficiency, which is the area of my mash filter brewer is running, you'll see uh, 72 pounds of extract per 100 barrels. So what does that mean of our potential extract? Um, this example is 75.8% uh, extract. Um, of that 78 pounds, we're only getting 49 pounds of it. That's not great. Uh, 60 is a little better, and then getting 72 or 75 is, is pretty darn good. What does that mean? On an extract basis, a 60% efficient brewery, or 65%, is it having a 35% loss of their grain. You wouldn't accept that on aluminum cans, you wouldn't accept that on labels, you wouldn't accept that on almost anything, but it's commonly done uh, with malt. Mash filter runs 95% efficiency, 3.8% uh, of the total grain weight is lost, translates to about a 5% loss. That's pretty good. Uh, the equipment's a little more advanced, we'll get into mash filters a little bit more, but that's kind of where this extract number comes from. Any questions on how to calculate extract? Pounds per barrel? I see people taking pictures. If you come up to me afterwards and take my card and send me an email, I will send you this presentation. And I'll send you an extract head. <laughs> it's really good for a nice you can't sleep. <clears throat> so what is a mash filter? Um, mash filters technology goes back more than 100 years. This is not new technology. This is a, a mash filter in Schenectady, New York, for Agile like Brewing Company. 35% uh, of the beer in the world is actually made on mash filters. It's not, uh, not some obscure thing. Over the years, there's been updates to the process. And as the cost of raw materials increases, uh, these technologies become very um, desirable for small brewers. So what is a mash filter? This is kind of a weird, long definition. It's a multiple frame filter with alternating recess chambers. Uh, I'll show pictures in a second. Uh, basically, we have a whole series of vertical water tunnels. Um, we pump mash into the filter chambers, which retain this grain husk. Um, and then the sweet work continues on the process. We then chase that with hot water to sparge, just like you do with a traditional water ton or combination mash water ton. And then in a modern mash filter, we can actually inflate every other plate and squeeze and recover that liquid as well. Um, yeah, without that squeeze, we're probably going to run about 90% efficient. Um, I know some larger breweries that are probably averaging just under 90, probably between 87 and 92%, depending on the, the, uh, the grist. Uh, so who's using mash filters? You know, worldwide there's some big brewers. Uh, Coors, their Golden Colorado plant is all mash filtration. Bass, Carlsberg, Heineken, Guinness, Chimay, Full Sail, Alaskan Brewing Company, Crux Fermentation Project, project in uh, Bend, Oregon, Calvert in uh, Maryland. Paps, Milwaukee also ran on a mash filter. Their mash filter was actually built in the 50s or 60s. It was an old strain master. Um, in New York State, uh, Genesee Brewing Company, their new brew house is uh, Mash Filter. Matt Brewing Company in Utica, they've been running a Mash Filter since their brew house was installed in, I think, the 30s and 40s. So, like I said, not new technology. 
Frog Alley locally, Good Nature in Hamilton, Roaring Twenties, which is over in uh, Lebanon, just east of here. Industrial Arts also has a match built here. So they're, they're showing up more and more. So why is it, uh, what, how, what makes it work? So we, I looked up Darcy's Law, this is what came up. This is how wart separation works. This is how laudering works. This is how mash filters work. This is how liquid flows through a bed. This actually work was done on measuring how liquid flowed through sand in the 1850s. Uh, but basically flow rate is equal to permeability coefficient, which has to do with the size of the grist. Surface area, more surface area, you have faster flow. Higher pressure, you can push more liquid through. Viscosity, we can decrease viscosity by heating the mash. And length of the filter bed. The length of the filter bed is the distance across this area here. How much grain am I going through? We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, so advantages of the mash filter, you have greater surface area. Um, you know, we have a lot more. Instead of having one, you know, six, seven foot diameter uh, water ton, we actually have multiple filter plates where wort flows through this plate. Um, I know on a small 20 hectoliter at Prague Alley, I think there's 37 plates, if I remember right. Uh, but we also have well, pressure we can manipulate. In a lot of time, we actually have water flow through the bed by gravity. That's kind of our speed. We have one speed. We can't change gravity unless you can mount one of these things in the centrifuge. Um, using a pump, we can actually increase pressure and increase flow through the uh, system. We can also lower the viscosity by raising mash temperature up at the end. You know, you'll mash, go through your temperature steps. You may wind up in the 150s. Uh, if you, at the end, if you want to raise that temperature up, you actually make the liquid flow faster by lowering the viscosity. And the big advantage in the mash filter is the filter bed. Uh, you know, you'll have a, a filter bed thickness of two to three inches here. So we have got lots of flow, easy to get through, versus water ton, where you might have 16 to 24 inches of bed depth, and sometimes more, sometimes less. It's kind of generalization. Um, I work with a company, we have a 20 hectoliter mash filter, so 20 hectoliters is 17 barrels. The surface area of that mash filter is the equivalent of having a lauder ton 18 feet in diameter. So it's a significant increase in surface area to increase your flow. So how does it work? Uh, first part, mash filter is filled. We pump mash in between the plates and fill the chambers. At that point, grain is stacking up against the membrane, and sweet wort is actually continuing on to the brew kettle. When that's done, uh, all the husk materials have wound up in here. We then chase water behind that and push a slug of water through that grain to recover all that sweet extract. It's basically our sparging process. And after that, we can actually inflate uh, the bladders in the systems and actually squeeze and recover all that sweet wort. And that gives us about a 5% uh, boost. The spent grain comes out nice and dry. Uh, here's a gentleman here who's scraping spent mash out. You can see it's coming out as a big pancake there. That's probably falling down to a bin below or auger or a conveyor, depending on the system. And here's a picture of my hairy wrist holding a sample of spent grain. It's actually pretty dry, about the consistency of um, meatloaf is how I describe it. Um, nice thing about that is it's about 70% solids. It's not really wet. It doesn't start to stink in a few hours, you've got a couple of days on it. And there are people right now that are going out and buying spent grain from brewers to use for animal feed and actually introducing it into uh, the people food stream as well. Um, and this spent grain is quite a bit more stable than you'd find out of water ton. You know, all that water that was in here has gone on into the batch of beer rather than being stuck with the grain. Uh, so water, the traditional brew house, um, it's not uncommon to see water use rates um, up to seven barrels per barrel of finished beer and above. Uh, like I said, that uh, dry grain makes a big difference. Uh, we have a lot of water that's carried out in spent grain in a mash water uh, uh, ton. In a mash filter, we can actually recover that by giving it a squeeze. Um, and actually, those water numbers can actually be down to three barrels of water used per barrel of beer shipped. We still have water used for cleaning. We still have water used for chasing, filtration, things like that. For example, Alaskan Brewing Company took their uh, lauder ton out and put a mash filter in. This was a huge savings for them. Uh, Jeff Larson did this years ago. Um, he's now using 3.6 barrels of water to make one barrel of finished beer. Um, 
they had some extra challenges in Alaska. Uh, they could not compost spent grain there because it's so cold, the ground's permanently frozen. They used to have to ship all their spent grain to the lower 48 states to be recycled. So significant savings for them. That's why this was a viable solution for them earlier than most brewers. At this point, their spent grain is so dry, they can blend it with wood um, pellets and fire a boiler with it. So spent grain provides them with 50% of their steam. So it's a different way to recycle it. It's so dry. Um, this is another parameter you should be looking at in your brewery. How many barrels of water do you use to make your 1,000 barrels of beer, your 5,000 barrels of beer? Um, you know, water is a limited resource. Water has costs associated with it. Water itself is usually cheap. Getting rid of the water, your wastewater charge is what's most of your um, water bill. And then if you're a smaller brewery that happens to be out remote, small farm brewery, and you've got wastewater issues, this is a great way to reduce uh, the amount of water you use. So speed, uh, mash filter, uh, typically you can start a mash starting every two hours. So you mash in, you move through your temperature steps, you go through your mash filter. At that point, you're mashing in the next brew behind it. Uh, the fast I've seen is uh, a brewery in Poland, a Carlsberg plant. I uh, visited a couple of years ago. They were turning 14 brews in 24 hours. And they were running about 93% efficient in the main process, and they were also taking their waste, they couldn't squeeze their system, but they would let that grain run dry later and use that water to mash in their next batch, and they were able to get their extraction up even higher. Typically, you see an extraction, a brew house efficiency of about 95%. The big benefit there is cost savings. You're gonna reduce the amount of grain you need to make the same beer. Um, and then, like I said, water usage is a big number as well. We can cut that basically in half. So differences between mash tons and water, um, or mash filters and water tons. Water ton typically see four to eight brews per day, day being 24 hours. Um, mash filter, that number goes up significantly, 12 to 14 brews is pretty typical. Um, thick bed versus thin bed, you know, the having that lower value for uh, bed depth, uh, we've got a faster flow rate. Um, mash filter is basically a whole series of small thin beds piped together. Uh, extract recovery, big difference there. You know, we see a lot better extract recovery there. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different is loading. You know, on a water ton, you can put more grain in. You know, you're gonna have a thicker bed depth. It's gonna slow you down a little bit, not a big deal. A mash filter does need to be fully loaded to work because you wanna be able to sparge through the grain, not around the grain. If you don't load it fully, you'll have challenges there. So the way to deal with that is you can take the end plate in and change the size of the mash filter. Typically, your mash filter loading is about 40 pounds of grain per cubic foot. There's a great research paper from Pabst in the 1990s on that, or 1980s on that. Um, um, a lot of breweries I've talked to over the years that have changed from lauder uh, to mash filter, uh, they typically see a, a big change in how the grain converts. By having a fine grist, uh, conversion happens much, quick, much quicker. Uh, you'll see conversion typically in 10, 15 minutes, um, sometimes a little bit longer with a mash filter depending on how fine you go. Uh, that's where you might be seeing, you know, 40, 50 minutes on a traditional um, mash or combination mash lauder. Uh, what that means though is if you mash in, you're going to convert at what temperature you're at. you're at. You don't have 10 minutes to adjust your temperature, so it's important that you get that right. Um, so some of the breweries I know that transitioned from lauder to filter found that they had to adjust their process to make sure they hit temperature right away or potentially they'd be undershooting their mash temperature and winding up with a slightly drier beer. So that's a little watch out, but it can be overcome. Water usage, like I said, significant reduction. Um, you know, if you have a separate mash vessel, you can go through temperature steps as well. Uh, if you have a combination mash water ton, you cannot do that. Uh, the benefit to heating up is you're gonna lower your viscosity back to the Darcy equation. We'll see things run uh, much faster. Um, on the mash filter, having husk material is not really that important. We don't need husk. You know, we're only going through this much bed depth. Um, so it's pretty common to run a brew at 50% wheat. It's a normal day. It doesn't slow you down at all. As where with a water ton, you're adding things like rice hulls. Uh, you may plan a very long brew day in that case. 
I've even seen some pretty unusual grain bills, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we can do some pretty unusual tricks with a mash filter. I've got a project I'm working on, I'll talk about in a minute, using 100% unmalted grain. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it's a pretty significant reduction in energy and carbon footprint by skipping the malting process. Um, yeah, there's some unusual ingredients that I have not had a chance to play with that I think would be really interesting. We don't need husk. You can buy New York malted hullless barley that has 85% potential extract. So you can put an awful lot of extract in your brew. Um, like I said, adjuncts, you can use unusual grains um, and unmalted barley. The maltsters don't want to hear this. It's about 70% less expensive than malted barley. Um, pretty easy to do on a mash filter. You can also do some unusual things like rye beer, 75% rye. Has anybody had a 75% rye beer ever? I've made one. It's a little bit slow that day, not a big deal. It's kind of a regular brew day though. Efficiency uh, with the speed, you can see reduced labor costs with a properly sized system. What I mean by that is by being able to pump you know, your mash through the filter faster than the water, and by going through your conversion quicker, you need to have the rest of the brew house built up to handle that. So you need to be able to process uh, your kettle and whirlpool and keep things moving on that end, otherwise you're gonna back up pretty quick. Um, and mash filters are also commonly used in European uh, whiskey distilleries to do separation. In the US we're used to bourbon where people are mashing grain and fermenting it with all the grain in there. European whiskeys typically have some type of separation lauder, or in many cases now, they've migrated to mash filters for efficiency. Um, so I mentioned the 100% adjunct beer. Um, I do a lot of work with IDD. I also have some uh, small contract customers. Uh, this is a project I've been working on uh, for a little while, and I'm continuing on with it now. We're making a Kolsch style beer with 100% unmalted grain. A very green, earth friendly beer. Uh, you know, we have to process the grain a little bit differently. Um, unmalted grain is about 11 to 12% uh, moisture. So we've had to adapt our milling for that. We found by going through a roller mill that kind of was a little bit gummy and didn't break up the way malt does. So we've elected to use an outside milling company to process that grain and hammer mill it. Um, but, you know, it's a mash filter, no husk, no problem, so that beer runs through just fine. Um, like I said, about 70% savings. Uh, this product is actually made with 100% New York um, unmalted barley and 100% New York hops. Um, and it's a pretty good reduction in carbon footprint. Uh, we've actually done three successful uh, full-scale test brews. Uh, we should have this product in the market next month. And we did the math on it. We're seeing about a 2.5 kilogram of CO2 reduction uh, per hectoliter of beer. That's more than a five pound CO2 bottle per barrel of beer. It's pretty significant. Uh, so this customer's focus is making uh, a very environmentally friendly beer, and this process has allowed us to do that. You know, we did see and calculate the additional cost of going through all the mash steps, but the energy savings on malting more than offsets that we're seeing quite a significant reduction there. And I've seen a lot of uh, some Eastern European brewers that are using um, unmalted grain as an adjunct. I visited a brewery in Poland, I mentioned before. They had a malt facility right next door. And as far as you can see were barley fields. And they were using 70% malted barley and 30% unmalted grain. Made a really nice light pilsner. Um, in this project we've had to work through a few things. We found that unmalted grain really has no color has little uh, body left in it. So we've actually worked uh, with some New York maltsters and some unique products to help offset that to keep it all unmalted in all New York. We've had good success with that. Uh, that'll be out uh, next month. A uh, couple of common misconceptions. Yes, Bill? Um, Rich, you said it's coming up from where? Not Frog Alley or? Frog Alley will be reducing it for us. Okay. Yeah, I've got a relationship there. Laura's gonna be on the brew deck making that beer. And I'll come watch as a customer. Good, good deal, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so misconceptions, um, 
Uh, I've heard some mash filter producers say you must use a hammer mill, it has to be done. There's no way to use a roller mill. Well, that's definitely not true. Most of the mash filter beer made in the United States is made on a roller mill. Um, Mira says that's not possible. Mac Brewing Company Utica runs a, a Bueller 6 roller mill. Uh, Coors and Golden, largest mash filter um, producer in this half of the world, they're also in roller mills. So it can be done. I think we do see probably a, about a half to 1% reduction in efficiency there. But the benefit there is roller mills are easier to maintain than hammer mills. Hammer mills have a significant uh, cost to install based on the high energy usage and maintenance can be a bit of a problem as well. On a small brewery that doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, you can't match the flavor of water ton. Again, not true. Coors Light is made in Golden, Colorado. It's also made in uh, Elkton, uh, Virginia. Virginia is made on a water ton. Coors main plant is uh, um, mash filter. It's the same beer. And now they're making those beers in Old Miller plants, so definitely not true. Uh, the one concern I've had people ask about, um, I've been in the brewing business for a little over 30 years. Made a lot of beer over the years. The last four million barrels have been on uh, mash filters. I had a group of home brewers come in and ask for a tour one day. Sure, I'll talk to anybody about beer. You guys are doing it today. Um, I'll sh not shut up if we have plenty of beer to keep drinking. Um, but uh, we went through the whole process. They'd never seen a mash filter, didn't know what to think of it. Um, and one of the guys pipes up in the back says, you can't do that. I said, what? He says, you can't do that. I said, okay, I'll bite. What are you talking about? What are you I don't understand that. I can't do that. Well, all your beers are really harsh and really husky. I'm like, okay, you three over here are drinking Pilsner. Is that beer harsh and husky? No, it's really good. So I worked at a brewery commercially for a year and a half. And I know that would make terrible beer. I'm like, well, I've been doing this for 30 years and you're drinking the beer, so you tell me. <laughs> um, you know, Coors Light, Heineken, those are all made on mash filters. You know, those beers are not harsh, they're not husky. It takes good brewing practice. Um, proper pH control is really important on a mash filter. Just as important on a water tub. You know, if you have pH at a range in your mash or sparge, you're gonna extract undesirable flavors. And maybe it's more obvious on a mash filter because you are getting everything out of that brew. Yes? Well, how would you adjust your pH in your mash stove? Well, you, you go through your mash and you treat your water, get your minerals in there, get your desired pH. All that in your mash filter, you then prepare your sparge water and, and treat that as well, and then push that through. So see mash, see, so see like you go in and like you're at 5.5. Absolutely, it's a traditional mesh mixer. You've got heating surface, you've got a mixer, so you can do anything you want you'd normally do in a traditional mash cycle. The difference is really at the water ton, and just like, well, I mean, I guess the water ton, you could put your water in and throw your acid in there and hope it mixes in. Ideally, you should mix that acid in your water before you do that, but people feel good about just throwing it on top and hoping for the best. Uh, so we would basically treat that sparge water um, before we push that through there. And that's where the issue is. The, the mash is all the same. But that's true of any brew house. It's not unique to mash filters. And, you know, mash filter breweries win medals. Good Nature's won medals. Frog Alley's picked up four medals four years in a row. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good beer locally and a lot of really good beer on the world stage that are made with mash filters. It's not, not rocket science. So I do a lot of work with IDD. Uh, we make a mash filter system. Um, it's a fully compact system on a skid. Not really compact, I guess it's 20 hectoliter. It fits on four skids that bolt together. Um, you know, we're seeing typically 95% extraction on these. We're seeing you know, eight hour shift, about three batches through, eight hours and 10 minutes. Uh, she's got to work on that. <laughs> but it's a, uh, you know, it's a very efficient system, uh, significant water reduction uh, we're seeing. Um, on the milling side, we do tend to mill a little tighter. We take a two-roller mill and we run the rollers at slightly different speeds to get high shear. Uh, that gives us nice fine grist to give us that fast conversion and good runoff. And then uh, we also design the kettle to have adequate steam so we can boil off 10% in about 40 minutes. Uh, that way there we can get that kettle cleared out and moved on to the whirlpools so we can have the next batch that we mashed in come right behind it. It uh, allows us 
breweries I worked at, we've been able to go from brewing one batch a day of one flavor and doubling up uh, and tripling up without worrying about how much lag time we have between fermentations. Um, keep the same flavor that way. Um, here's a, a graph here that talks about on a two vessel mash water combination, uh, kind of whirlpool combination. You cannot start a brew until stuff's out of your way. Uh, so you typically see, um, you know, in a 12 hours period, you might get two brews start to finish and then hopefully be your, your third one on the way. And if you had a three vessel, you can actually start to do a little bit more versus our mash system is designed to start a new brew every two hours. But like I said, somebody's got to run, don't get in their way. Um, so takeaways, mash filters higher efficiency. Uh, we can extract more sugars uh, during the mash. We can get higher root house efficiency. We can get more beer from the same amount of grain. Now, as malt prices keep going up, this is definitely beneficial. Faster processing time, mash filter can extract sugars quickly. Uh, we can shorten the brewing time. We can put more brews to the system. So we can either cut labor there or make more beer. Uh, sustainability, you know, using less water and less grain. Uh, having nice dry spent gains gives you other ways to process those. Like I said, they can sit around for a short, longer period of time. Uh, we can also send those in other directions rather than just uh, composting or feeding the cows. And the cows still like the spent grain even without all the sugar in it. So that's all I got. I'll take any questions you guys have. I'll be here the rest of the conference. So, to be just overview, uh, how much size does it take up in the house? How many dollars does it cost? Um, I would say it's a little more expensive than a, a real simple combination system, but the payback is definitely there when you start. You start seeing, you know, New York malt prices upwards of a dollar a pound, you know, and you can see that you're capturing most of that rather than letting a third of it go down the drain. Um, if you want to talk to me, I can get you uh, pricing. We do make systems that are uh, five hectoliter, seven and a half hectoliter, fifteen, or twenty hectoliter, and forty hectoliter. And we can do some other weird stuff too. We've had some people go crazy with this. Um, you know, the traditional system is basically one mash filter, hot liquor, mash, kettle, whirlpool. Um, pretty straightforward. You can actually also sister that system with a whole other brew house. And you can use two kettles, two mash tons, two whirlpools, and one mash filter. That's not your bottleneck. So you can, you can get crazy and then you start to push, you know, 20 plus brews through the system today. You know, you'd be surprised, you know, we have uh, in Frog Alley, there's a small, Five hectoliter system. It's a two vessel, so it's a uh, mash cooker, mash filter, combination kettle whirlpool, and we would turn typically two brews to that in about six and a half hours, which is pretty good. We could do better if we added a separate whirlpool, but that system was put in for a pilot brewery. We we're doing small batch stuff, but you know if you go from you know that combination kettle whirlpool to a separate whirlpool, you can do you know four brews in ten hours. So you can make, you know, a single batch of stout, a single batch of double IPA, a double batch of lager, and something else. So you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, the brews, you can go from batch to batch, recipe to recipe, no problem. Yes, Luke? What's the uh, maintenance, and, you know, what do you have to clean the filter out, and how often your membranes do you change? Membranes last for years. Uh, between each brew, you need to give them a good hose down. And we typically use a little enzyme in the mash to help prevent stuff from building up on there to keep that um, going longer. Typically, we'll see a cleaning cycle every two weeks would be great. And that cleaning cycle is about um, you know, half a day. But uh, otherwise, it's a brew house. You've got the occasional pump seal, but the membranes are not a, a high wear item. Laura runs one. Matt runs one. If you have questions, you can ask them. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Uh, can you talk about um, automation um, on kind of like the 20 hectare system? Um, if it comes in with that size, of, um, or just your process in here? Um, our smaller systems are fairly manual. Um, 
which makes sense on that side. So when you start to get up to doing multiple brews per day, automation becomes more important. I don't call it a fully automated system. I don't think that's fair. I'm calling it a good semi-automated system. So anytime you do a, a mash and let stuff stick, the process will get to care of itself with the multiple steps for you. The PID tune and take care of your backup for you. So there's a lot of things that are automated, a lot of steps that are automated, but you, you still want to have a brewer involved in the process. So what are your processes for filling up your money? Um, running off, we have a, a limit to the pump pressure. We use an AOD pump, air operated diaphragm pump. Our way to control that is air pressure that we feed that off the regulator. Uh, in the kettle, we have uh, internal laundry, um, bottom steam jacket. Those are controlled by PID valves. We can actually scale those up and down 0-100% versus on and off. So we do use uh, PID proportional integral derivative to manage mash steps as well. So go through uh, and raise temperature quickly, but not overshoot. You know, there's a lot of potential bad things that happen in mash stepping. There's a whole series of enzymes in the 130s that uh, oxidize lipids in the mash, so you can actually get into those quick enough if you do want to go in in the 120s to do a protein mask. Answer your question? Or? Yeah, I'm trying to understand the yeah, I can answer the work I've heard. You can reach out to me afterwards. Yeah. Talk beer all day. Okay. Any other questions? Are there any similar products that German food? <clears throat> um, there's a German company I know that has a weird system of multiple strainers in a row. It's called the Nessie. It's made by Loch Ness Monster. I've seen a prototype, I've never actually seen it run. Um, well, it's cool. The lip's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was at the factory a couple years ago. It was pretty deep. I don't think it was actually small. It didn't It's like small buckets that have a stranger in buckets. It's wide bucket. It's, it looks awesome. Look it up. I probably not have a flat pack. I don't think it's actually been installed yet. Pretty good about the coaster. And that's why um, I'll. That's by Siemen, Holbrika. They make very large brewery tanks. And this is their pilot brewery in Stuttgart. I was fortunate enough to make a couple of batches of um, Saranac Pale Ale to do test brews on that a few years ago. It's very neat. Um, this design did not go forward. Down to they're pumping mash in here and bottom filling. So they found that they're losing all the extract from the bottom pocket. So science so coming done. It's fun. In this system here, all these natural complaints are all on the chain. Just push the button. Mm. Do you think there's any significant weakness, or what is the biggest weakness? I don't see problems with the filters. I think you do need to have a skilled brewer to start to really look at process. You need to start to look at your water chemistry. You know, when you're extracting that extra 50% extract, I think if you have problems flavor-wise, they're going to be more apparent than those final winnings. So I think having a skilled brewer and the ability to, to check them on their pH and understand the process, I think it's, I think it's kind of a, a race car. So I think it's you know, very powerful, but you do need to follow some rules as a brewer. But, uh, I've, like I said, I've been doing this for 30 years, mash filters for the last 15, so I do believe in technology. It's pretty neat, it's pretty scalable, pretty efficient. What about adding or removing plates? How, what's the process? Is it difficult, I'm assuming, like, obviously, you know, at least only add so many, but if you're doing a bigger beer or a smaller beer, taking those out, like. So in this system here, this is actually our construction product L. Down here is the end plate. So we can actually lift that plate, move that forward. If you're making a beer, there would be less gravity than the maximum. This is designed yeah. To hold, designed to hold 1,200 pounds of grain. 1,400 fits, I'll tell you that. Okay. Um, uh, there's a really good article on mash filter loading about 1982 by Pabst and Brewing Company, the Master Brewers. If you can't read some night, email me, I'll send a deal. Good for on the end. What do you do? If you squeeze the milk and go more than 12. Yeah, you can definitely go more than that. Um, you know, the power starter we're talking about, you can go, I think, 10% under or 20% over. 
and still have good flow through the system. If you start to overload like that, you're going to be limiting your efficiency a little bit. Everything will trade off. Yes? Uh, I see up there with the last time we were in, you said they um, run so dry, they used to buy them. Buy their boiler. What are they mixing it with? Did you say the wood shavings or sawdust? Or? Yes, yes, sawdust. Do you already source that from? It's Alaska. They have a lot of beers. <laughs> 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 but so their challenge used to be they had to get rid of this grain by putting it in a bark and shipping it. Um, so they found it more so close they could almost sort of biomass boiler in it. So uh, they found the limitation was still just a little bit too much moisture here, but they found they could reduce that moisture as a total. By blending in with the wood. It could be from the source of maybe from the mill. It could be a waste pipe from the mill. What was that? Um, Jeff Larson, probably look him up online on the website. Really good guy. for me to talk about it. I think he's done some work with Master Brewers and the Brewers Association. Just be aware, he's so far away, he doesn't know what day it is there at first starts. <laughs> Jeff what? Jeff Larson. Thank you. G E O F F. Um, and they, they have a really good history of sharing their stuff they've done with the yeah, Brewers Association. Um, I did make a mistake once I was at the Sabre event in Washington, yeah. D.C. and I was hanging out with my boss, Dick Matt, and I was sitting around drinking beer. At one point, about half the room, was a little later, much more the room, was at the West Coast. And I'm at the bar with Nick and Jeff Larson, and he's so far away, he doesn't have a thing. He's always out to me. <laughs> But he's really he's done a lot of work and published a lot on this. Uh, is it, uh, they, they, because of their geography, uh, they've got some challenges that they made this affordable much sooner. So they've passed this to us. Maybe send me an email, I'll be happy to get you. That nasty doesn't do it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Does it actually work? They said they. Done to pass through. Yeah, it was. It's a rotary screen. Why the fuck is it? Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, they consider that magic. Yeah. 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 That's the filter, I guess. Yeah, it's all for It looks like a dragon head. Thank you, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.